Hello, this is Graham Brown, Senior Vice President with NextGen Healthcare and Principal with the NextGen Advisors. Welcome to our podcast series. Today, we want to explore the topic of the shift in the United States toward value-based care and alternative payment models, and the specific impact the COVID-19 pandemic may have as an accelerator of that shift. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Marty Lusta and Dr. Betty Rubinowitz. Welcome, Marty and Betty. Hi, Graham. Hey, Graham. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, stated last year that they want to have 100% of providers taking on some downside financial risk by 2025. Currently, however, less than 20% of Medicare spending is value-based, meaning a trillion dollars of healthcare risk will be shifting from the government to hospitals, health systems, and physician practices across the country, should CMS benchmark be met. This analysis is based on a new report by Coveries, a medical professional liability insurance company based in Boston. Before we get into the details, what's your overall gestalt of shifting a trillion dollars in healthcare risk to providers? Is that even viable? Marty? Yeah, um, my initial reaction is no, <laughs> given the current state of the delivery systems. I don't think that across the country that the majority of providers are prepared to take on that level of risk. The one qualifier I would put in this is there's all different kinds of risk. And to say that people have to all be have downside risk by 2025 doesn't necessarily mean a trillion dollars worth of downside risk. So that would be my one qualifier in it. Betty, what are your thoughts? Uh, it feels like a very tall order because it, it means that rapid uh, changes will have to occur across the healthcare system. Uh, we're immersed in the COVID pandemic at the moment, which is probably slowing down uh, focus and ability of groups to really introduce structural change on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, COVID has exposed the need to switch from a uh, totally volume-driven environment in that groups who were uh, already in a value-based kind of environment did better. So I think there's a bit of rekindled interest and some new energy around uh, these uh, plans. So probably I I wouldn't put a bet on it, but uh, being the optimist, I would say possible. I guess the other thing to your point, Betty, is that COVID has shown us that providers across the country are able to change the way they deliver care very quickly when they have to. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of rapid innovation this year. It's if uh, Trump gets reelected in a second term, he may slow down the the movement uh, with the Affordable Care Act or on the contrary, accelerate it because it's, it, there, there's much of this that's bipartisan. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of moving parts at the moment. After the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, CMS created the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which was established to test or pilot many different alternative payment models. Most widely adopted of these are the Accountable Care Organization, where providers collectively take accountability for managing the cost and quality of care, and bundled payment programs, which provide a flat reimbursement rate for all the care associated with a procedure or managing a condition over a period of time, like a hip or knee replacement or even a pregnancy. Some argue these models are unsustainable for the long term because participants are involved in a, quote, race to the bottom in terms of pricing, where they're lowering the floor of the total compensation they're going to get. At the same time, some have been extremely popular, these programs, with many different provider organizations participating and definitely profiting when they've contracted with CMS in these programs. Betty, why do you think that is? I think that all of these programs are designed to incent the early adopters to enter in the programs, take on, if you will, the risk of participating in them and have created strong financial incentives for them to do so. 
I think that the race to the bottom is basically achieving the goal of these programs, which is to reduce the overall cost of health care. What's interesting here is that many of the groups entering into these programs aren't considering the five years down the road or, or so. And there really is no alternative for groups because groups who are forced to join later on in the program won't have the benefit of the incentives at the, at the start of the program and will have pricing pressures that are no different than the groups that participated initially. So really, at the end of the day, this isn't to enrich the uh, health delivery system. This is to remove dollars from the health delivery system, and it will achieve its goals in that regard. How it looks when we've reached the uh, steady state of pricing, will there be less specialists? Will there be centers of excellence? With, it is difficult to know what price pressure will do in terms of availability of these services or what the system will look like. But it's achieving its goals so far. Yeah, I would take a slightly different angle on this in that I wouldn't use the word pricing because it, it, it implies that the unit cost of services is where the savings are as opposed to the more appropriate use of services, which you know, estimates from the Dartmouth Atlas that as much of a third of the care in Medicare is of no value uh, or negative value. Uh, There's a long ways to go in terms of removing the waste in the system that is known to already exist to sustain this approach for quite a while. Beyond that, the, the issue is really, it gets down to the detailed levels, I think, from an actuarial point of view when you look at the annual in, in, uh, injection of new technologies into the system and the projected increases in cost due to inflation and due to new technology, can, can you have a system where the providers are consistently incented to moderate that inflationary pressure, in, which is always going to be there? So I agree the early adopters are going to have a huge advantage because there's so much opportunity for savings right now. But I do believe this is a model that's sustainable in the long run as well. I think one of the areas that's been interesting for me to watch with both ACOs and with bundle payments is they are more successful in areas of the United States that have a higher level of variability in in the delivery cost. So when you look across the U.S. at the average Medicare spending um, per beneficiary per year, there's a huge difference from one state to another. You know, some states average nine to ten thousand dollars a year; others are at a very high end of seventeen thousand dollars per year. And so there's really opportunity within that space for participants to enter in. You know, as early participants realize the shared savings opportunities and ultimately, you know, benefit from this at a program level while achieving the, the program's goals of dropping the overall total cost of care. Yeah, I, I think that's an important part of you know, the early winners, those high performers in places that have a lot of variation in costs. Unfortunately, the other early winners are oftentimes those who are the lowest performers, who have the most Absolutely. opportunity for improvement, who are able to establish a very high cost baseline and even, a, a, I hate to say it this way, but a low quality baseline as well. And in, in the early years, it's not very difficult for them to demonstrate significant improvement, even though they may still be below average compared to the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, coming from Rochester, New York, w- th- this community has always uh, contended that we started out with very low costs and that it's very difficult to continue lowering those costs uh, consistently. So just to uh, pile on the point you're making, Betty, back 10, 15 years ago when we were working on introducing value-based care in Rochester, we invited the leaders of a uh, nationally renowned organization that was uh, already in value-based care to present some of their results and their findings and what we saw from their presentation 
is that after all of their interventions, they had gotten to utilization levels in their Medicare population that were almost as low as what Rochester already was before we started. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, in our travels and um, talking to next-gen clients, for example, in Florida, it's clear that the reason why Medicare Advantage programs are thriving in Florida is that they're starting from such a high spend level that any difference, any delta that they can create, there's a lot of low-lying fruit to uh, create uh, savings in that uh, specific geography and population. The CMS Innovation Project models are built on a fee-for-service chassis where providers still need to account for every procedure, visit, and interaction by the care team with the patient. Wouldn't it be easier to move away from fee-for-service entirely and move to a different model of payment like a per-member-per-month approach, either provided prospectively or retrospectively? Marty? Well, I'll, I'll reveal that, you know, I'm very biased towards prepayment model myself, having practiced in one for the first 17 years of my career. Uh, but that said, absent requirements from the government in this space, there's enormous inertia here in the health plans across the country, whether they're in the commercial space or they're man- functioning as managed care organizations for Medicaid or Medicare, have enormous investments in their claims processing systems, as do the providers in their billing uh, systems. So to move away from that infrastructure is almost like changing from a horse and buggy to a car. Uh, It's gonna gonna really be a a huge shift in the infrastructure on, on both sides. So I think that's an obstacle to this change really moving forward quickly. Interestingly, a lot of our data systems are now dependent on the structure of claims and the itemization of activities that occur in a hospital admission or in an ambulatory event, series of events. But I, I, I think there's an interim stage where the payment is done for a kind of incapitated uh, approach, but that there is still a collection of utilization data that allows measuring practice pattern variation, allows measuring uh, individual activities and, and tracking their impact on cost and outcomes. So it might end up being a hybrid uh, system rather than completely abolishing claims. I must say, though, from a data perspective, no data person will shed a tear if claims go away in the sense that it's a, it's a, it's a chaotic environment with multiple formats, no standards. Uh, commercial pairs each have their own formats. CMS obviously has uh, theirs, uh, which is quite uh, predictable and, and transparent, but it, it, it has added a huge burden to trying to work with that data and rationalize it and create insights from it that are useful or helpful. That's an interesting point about the hybrid, because when, when I was in the Kaiser Permanente system, at the beginning of my career, we did not have any coding of our appointments. We saw our patients and we moved on to the next patient. There was no submission of anything administrative. But we quickly evolved after I was there when they started introducing copays and uh, the need for more analysis that we actually evolved into, even though there was no bill and there was no claim submitted, the kind of quasi claim submission that you're describing just so that we had the information and so we could apply it to benefit structures and such. Absolutely. Well, and to some extent, you know, a bundle payment model is that hybrid approach where you're still using the existing mechanics to track what care is provided, even though the payment isn't directly associated with what is captured at a fee-for-service level. Um, So it is maybe moving in that direction. We're still capturing the quality and the utilization information, as you're saying, Betty, that's really important to understand whether these programs are impactful or not, using the language that's there now to do it. 
The underlying theme of the Covery's report is that healthcare spending is increasing at too fast a pace and must be constrained or it'll drive financial insolvency at the national level. If we look internationally, other countries employ very different levers to mitigate against medical inflation, like negotiating market price for pharmaceuticals, setting limits on the utilization of complex and expensive new diagnostics, or setting the limit on professional fees that will be paid to providers on an annual basis. Uh, do you think that these or other strategies could be tested in the U.S.? And if so, what circumstances would need to be in place for us to consider this? Betty? It's a good question. I think that once the, the basis by which we... Uh, so if we move into advanced payment models and organizations are now carrying downside risk as well as uh, upside risk, the ability or the appetite to innovate around some of those areas will probably increase. There's something about, uh, you mentioned the inertia of the fee-for-service uh, process and what it incents and uh, what it disincents that has uh, caused this lack of innovation or inventiveness or exploration or experimentation. So it definitely uh, uh, could introduce changes. Clearly, we need to do something, and, and we might get to it in a, in a few moments. Clearly, we're going to need, need to do something about how we measure quality uh, in this construct, because that is obviously a antiquated and not very uh, productive way of doing so. Yeah, it's, I do think it's a good question, that, and the approaches that you mentioned, Graham, uh, my concern is that I'm not sure that they would make it through the current legal system in the United States. If there was an attempt uh, by the government, for example, to do group purchasing of pharmaceuticals, would the pharmaceutical industry take the government to court and who would win? And you can pick any of the examples that you gave in a lot of the levers that are used in other countries and well accepted there, I think would meet enormous resistance in the legal system. And I'm not sure how that would get how we would overcome it but you know i agree with betty's point as we move down this path there's going to be more and more of a need to look at those issues yeah you know the um the affordable care act in 2010 and the accompanying legislation that established the center for medicare and medicaid innovation i think really was one of those foundational steps forward that allowed for innovation to occur? Because I think you raised some really important points, Marty. As healthcare funding legislation is structured right now in the United States, I think these um, approaches might indeed be subject to being tested and pushed back uh, in the legal system. We don't have the right legislative framework to actually test them properly. So there might need to be some real consensus uh, at a political level to try and move in this direction, test some of these procedures, but they'd ultimately need to do it through a new legislative construct if it was actually gonna be viable and not tested uh, in the courts. So finally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the COVID-19 pandemic may be an accelerant to the shift in value-based care reimbursement. Do you think that's occurring, Marty? Do you think it's gonna go faster um, either through COVID or post COVID? Yeah, I mean, I. Based on you know our our own listening tour of providers across the country, I think we heard that message from providers that was only reinforced by this article that you referenced at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, that you know, even though there seems to be a little bit of a pause, the government has clearly signaled that they intend to uh, do whatever it takes to keep this moving forward and then to accelerate it once we get to a more stable situation. So uh, I, I do think that the, the pandemic has accelerated things. Um, I agree with Marty. I think that it's the first time in a while that the darling of a lot of groups, uh, fee-for-service, disappointed them. And they had their heart broken with uh, suddenly their offices 
because of the pandemic, uh, suffering huge challenges because uh, uh, patients with uh, lockdowns and and just uh, generally the pandemic not coming in. So it's the first time that I've heard skepticism about fee-for-service being this incredible, uh, the way to go or a um, a gift that just keeps on uh, giving. I think it exposed some vulnerability around that. Groups that had capitated payments continued to collect those and uh, fared much better than groups that didn't have them. I I agree with Marty in our conversations with groups across the country. We have heard a curiosity, a level of motivation to explore and enter in some other uh, types of payment agreements uh, that we haven't, I I don't think we were hearing last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. There does seem to be a different tenor to the conversation now, given the vulnerabilities of the past few months on on, uh, financials. I'd like to thank Dr. Betty Rabinowitz and Dr. Marty Lustig for this interesting discussion and sharing their insights today. Thank you also to our listeners for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. On behalf of NextGen Healthcare, this is Graham Brown. Have a great day.